This is Words Aptly Spoken, which comes from Proverbs 25:11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. The written word is a precious treasure. We want to preserve written knowledge for God's glory and as an anchor to the history of the church and its classical conversations. We hope to encourage the reading of words and of the word. So welcome to Words Aptly Spoken, where Jennifer Courtney, Timothy Knotts, and I discuss books from the Classical Conversations Curated Curriculum. Today is Wednesday, November 20th, 2024, and I'm Lee Bortons. Today we have with us Leslie Hubbard, our research strand leader for Classical Conversations Multimedia. So welcome to the show, Leslie. And then Jennifer, it's been an exciting month. Why don't you tell us what's been going on? Yeah, so we're still working our way through our suggestions for people who want to cultivate themselves as Christian leaders. Um, so we've talked about the pattern of God's truth and practicing affirmation. And we're going to talk about Nancy Piercy's The Soul of Science today, which I know is a book we all love. And then next week, we're taking a break in honor of Thanksgiving. But we do have a past episode on the Mayflower Compact that's pretty good for Thanksgiving. So. So maybe we can repost that one. So well, I just want everyone to know that you can access all of our past episodes on my YouTube channel at Lee Bortons, or you can visit my website, leebortons.com, which has both links to the podcast, the calendar for upcoming podcasts, and then links to classicalconversationsbooks.com, where you can buy the books we are talking about. And uh, with that, let's just jump in. Okay. And I want to know, I want you to know, Lee, that I did finish the 2025 calendar. So Emma's doing a little massaging to it. And those of you who are anxious for that to be up on the website, it's coming your way soon. Um, so you know what I'm going to ask you? Why is Nancy Piercy's book, The Soul of Science, one of our recommended resources for Christian leadership growth? Yeah, this is one I didn't have to spend much time thinking about from 1997. Well, I owned the book before then. But from 1997, when we started Classical Conversations, it was in the very first year of our curriculum. And here it still is. It was the book that we used as a classical resource for our students at that time to work on writing abstracts and scientific theses. Meanwhile, we moved on to other um, resources for the students, but have kept the soul of science for our tutors and parents to use, as well as a stretch for um, children that want to know more about how in the world is science uh, Christian? And who were the folks that contributed to Western science, Western civilization through the scientific method and so many more things? And what's really fun to me about the soul of science is both Nancy Piercy and Charles Thaxton, who wrote it with her, are alive and friendly to us and really appreciate all the years that our families have put into reading their books. And so um, it's nice to have some living authors among classical education. So I just think for the parents that want to uh, cultivate their abilities to just to be ready with an answer and maybe a field they're not as familiar with, science, uh, Einstein, uh, all kinds of things, physics, chemistry. It's just a really good book to introduce you to enough information to have confidence that the Lord's involved in all of it and maybe will help you with some some defense when you need it. Yeah, I love that. And Lee, when you and I met many years ago, um, you you were talking to me about this whole series, the Turning Point um, Christian Worldview series, and I have a number of them, as I know you do. Mm -hmm. So we have one other one in the curriculum, State of the Arts um, by Jean Veith that we use in Challenge 2. But I know that I was blessed by reading a number of these because one of mine and my husband's goal for our family was to have an integrated um picture of our studies and our Christian faith. And this series does that. And particularly Nan Nancy Piercy's book that we're talking about today does that for the natural sciences, which has mm -hmm. been a problem area for people to understand how does this idea go with my faith? So well, I just, even though using the word natural science or like Leslie, I'm sure I'll share later, natural philosophy or natural history. We've even changed the title of what we're really talking about. So I'm excited about this conversation. Yeah. 
All right. So Leslie, I think that's a good segue for me to pass the baton to you. As Lee said, this book has been a staple in classical conversation since the beginning, and you are yourself a scientist by trade. And um, you also have been part of the CC family for a long time. So I want to hear how this book has been important to, to you and also to CC's development of the right ways to practice science. Well, science and Christianity have a complicated relationship. And there's this persistent myth that science and Christianity have always been at war with each other. Um, and so the book, The Soul of Science, gives us a history of the philosophical ideas that are associated with the growth of science. Um, the development of science depended upon a Christian worldview, um, knowing that we lived in a tangible, physical universe that was created and held in being by an intelligent God, and therefore we could investigate it and we could expect to get answers from our investigations. So this book helps us to understand that this alliance we see between atheism and science is a temporary aberration. Christian theism has played, does play, and will continue to play an important role in the growth of scientific understanding. Yeah, I love that, Leslie. And one of the things that I've highlighted throughout my copy in blue um, is not always Piercy's um, argument itself, but she gives some wonderful quotations from, you know, um, pivotal scientists. And so today, as I was looking over the book, I read one from page 23, and this is Kepler. Um, and it says, in the spirit of the Reformation, the astronomer Johannes Kepler wrote of being called by God to use his talents in his work as an astronomer. In one of his notebooks, Kepler broke spontaneously into prayer Quote, I give you thanks, creator and God, that you have given me this joy in thy creation, and I rejoice in the works of your hands. See, I've now completed the work to which I was called. In it, I have used all the talents that you have lent to my spirit. That's one of my favorite scientist quotes that she includes, just to encourage us that of the great faith of these men and women. Well, that's what we've said about the study of science is that ultimately it should lead us to worship the creator. Yeah. Yeah, I love how she introduced that quote that he spontaneously broke out into prayer in his journal. That's great. So Tim, Nancy Piercy tells a little story in the introduction that um, I think will resonate with our us and our listeners as we dig into the history of science and math. Um, and as we look toward her view and not trusting the modern narrative. So um, I'll just read it here. What am I supposed to read? Or are you reading it? Either way. I'll let you read it. My voice is scratchy today. All right. So this is right from the beginning of the book. Um, she writes, uh, this is the, a quote from a, a person she was talking to. She said, Isaac Newton, a Christian? I never learned that in school. The young woman's jaw dropped in surprise. She had recently earned a master's degree in an honors program at a major university. She had been a leader in Christian campus groups, yet not once in her educational career had she learned that key figures in the history of science operated within a Christian framework, that their science was inspired and motivated by their religious convictions. Those of us who work in the sciences may be so familiar with these historical figures that we forget how remote they are to the average Christian in the pew. The typical science textbook is narrowly designed to acquaint science students with major scientific discoveries. It presents little of the scientists' underlying philosophical or religious motivations. The sole exceptions to that rule seem to be instances where philosophical or religious beliefs were rejected, such as Copernicus's rejection of Ptolemaic geocentric cosmology or Galileo's rejection of Aristotelian physics. This selective textbook presentation lead, tends to create in the student an implicitly positivist impression of science that progress in science consists in its emancipation from the confining fetters of religion and metaphysics. Typically, the student also assumes, at least unconsciously, that the historical characters who led this emancipation must have shared the same derogatory view of religion and philosophy. Yeah. <clears throat> You're muted, Lee. <laughs> Her comment about the negative things, well, while well, you were reading those names so very well, Tim, I was thinking about how I don't even think we heard those names um, when we went through school, let alone heard arguments for or against them. 
Yeah. I think it's no accident that I can name the one singular time that science and faith intersected in my life prior to me homeschooling. And that was, I had a a Christian biology teacher in high school, and he actually allowed us to have a creation and evolution debate, which is pretty amazing in and of itself. I don't, I don't know that that kind of open debate would be well received today, but that is the singular time I remember ever being allowed to think about this intersection of faith and the sciences prior to homeschooling. Hmm. I had one incident in college. I had a professor who wrote the textbook and we used this textbook on thermodynamics. And in the introduction, he said, if evolution is true and creation is not, nothing in this book can be true. And I thought that was quite a stance to make. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, there's some really good arguments in this book, which we'll encounter a few things today. Um, but I, I especially love that she does spend a fair amount of the beginning of the book tracing the history of um, the Western science science culture, scientific culture, um, you know, through the Middle Ages, uh, there there were scientists and philosophers who were working sort of relentlessly to try to harmonize the knowledge of the material with the knowledge of the immaterial to, to see how we understand um, spiritual truth or truth derived by reason and, and then find a proper relationship with what we can observe. Um, and so you, so you do end up with this thing that was called natural philosophy, which in, incorporates but is not limited to the materialist scientific view that we have today. Uh, so that that materialist view is actually redu- reductionistic, right? It takes something that's very big and it, and includes all kinds of inquiry into the natural world, into God's creation, and reduces it down to only the very physical things, that, like the material things that we can measure, observe, and repeat, and and thereby sort of think that we're proving things. Um, it's sad that natural philosophy got such a bad name <laughs> in the late Middle Ages by, from the from the alchemists, right? You had people like Paracelsus or Albertus Magnus who were trying to find ways to convert lead to gold um, or reanimate dead things. If you read Frankenstein uh, by Mary Shelley, <laughs> you'll hear some more about those. But those, those um, people gave some bad flavor um to what otherwise was really a pretty wholesome thing and so now we're picking up pieces and trying to put them back together uh, as christians who also believe in science yeah and i was thinking back to what leslie said that um one of my big takeaways from the book also was the idea that christianity makes science possible um and I have two places that I marked. Um, one is on page 25, where it talks about Copernicus. And he says that he his assumption, his beginning worldview was that creation, the universe was, quote, wrought for us by a supremely good and orderly creator. And so his own scientific work became a quest for a better cosmology or explanation of what he was seeing in the universe. One that would, in the words of theologian Christopher Kaiser, uphold the regularity, uniformity, and symmetry that befitted the the mind of God. Um, And then my second favorite, and then I want to hear from Leslie, um, was that this story that, um, and I used to tell this at practicums for years and years, that, um, that Kepler was struggling with measuring the... um, and calculating the orbit of the planet Mars. And he couldn't find these eight minutes and they weren't working in his calculation. And he kept looking and looking um, because he knew that, um, that God was so orderly that every, every moment counted. And so we owe a lot to his trust in the mind of God and its order that he kept looking. I'm pretty sure that I would go, yeah, that's pretty vast and out there eight minutes is not so bad to be off. (laughs) We can overlook that, right? (laughs) 
But it goes back to that fact that they could trust that because God was a God of order, they would be able to um, investigate and find answers to their questions. Um, I'd have to put myself in the same class with the jaw-dropping young woman, <laughs> because when I was a Christian student in college, there was no consideration for studying science within the framework of religion and the type of philosophical ideas that you have mentioned. If there was any conversation of that kind, it was to make the point that great discoveries that were made were made despite of or in refutation of Christian beliefs. Mm -hmm. um, so it was years later, outside the scope of my formal science education, that I learned that people like Newton and Descartes, Copernicus and others were working to prove or um, expand their religious beliefs and that they could do this because they believed in an ordered universe governed by God-given laws. For one thing, I think it's a mistake in modern education that we've changed here, at least at Classroom Conversations, is our challenge fee, which is about 13-year-old students, spend a semester looking at the history of science. I always thought it was ridiculous to jump into or to have little children who are reading about uh, science, not doing science, to, to be reading about it before they even knew who the people were that discovered it and that benefited from it. So we spend that semester learning a lot more about these names that uh, you know Tim just read before we jump into just the facts, ma'am, of a textbook that's you know fragmented into topics rather than holistically looking how the world was made. And even that is something that as we move forward in classical education, we get better and better at integrating the, the ideas that this book um, uh, expresses for national, natural history, natural philosophy, and natural, I just forgot the third one, science. science in the middle, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's one thing I appreciate too. So we have this nice um, progression, which as you said, we're working on refining, but the kids start off by asking questions about life science, things they can see and be excited about, and they notice and appreciate God's creation. Then we go into the history. And then one of the things I've really appreciated us adding in challenge four is Mitch Stokes book, Calculus for Everyone, because um, not only does he talk about the, the people who made discoveries, but he also establishes that calculus came about in order to solve a problem. And he does a great job of explaining the problem before he, for many chapters, before he ever asked the students to use calculus. And my, I know that my challenge four students really appreciated knowing the history of, um, you know, these Christian physicists who contributed, but also knowing, you know, that there's a question to be asked before we just leap in and start solving problems that were made up by someone else. Mm -hmm. So Good. yeah, I think we're getting better. All right. I think it's time for our break. Well, I'd like to thank our sponsor, classicalconversationsbooks.com, where the books discussed can be purchased. We have the entire 2024 Words Out Be Spoken calendar, and I'm going to stop saying 2024, 2023, 2024, and soon to be 2025 Words Out Be Spoken calendar at leadbortons.com with links to the Classical Conversations book site where you may purchase them, as well as uh, links to at Lee Bortons on YouTube so you can watch the podcast. So thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, in a few weeks, we're gonna turn our attention to another book called The Office of Assertion. I hope you have a great Thanksgiving during our holiday break. And I look forward to just continuing to talk here with my good friends. I know we have so much fun here, don't we? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna do the portion of our show where we start to read um, and do a close reading of some passages. <laughs> So um, one thing about this book is that it is an argument for restoring something that is important about historical science, but it's not blind to what modern thinkers have to say. So Tim, I'm going to let you read the first section to us where the authors, because um, I appreciate you reminding us, Lee, that this was co-written by Nancy Piercy and, and Charles Thaxton, where, where, these, where our co-authors cite uh, the Darwinian thinker and writer Lauren Isley. So Tim, take it away. Um, so this is from a section in, subtitled Christianity and the Scientific Revolution. The most curious aspect of the scientific world we live in, says science writer Lauren Isley, is that it existed at, it exists at all. Westerners, Westerners often unconsciously assume a doctrine of inexorable progress, 
as though the mere passage of time leads inevitably to increased knowledge as surely as an acorn becomes an oak. Yet the archaeologists would be forced to tell us, said Isley, that several great civilizations have arisen and vanished without the benefit of a scientific philosophy. The type of thinking known today as scientific, with its emphasis upon experiment and mathematical formulation, arose in one culture, Western Europe, and in no other. Science, Isley concludes, is not natural to mankind at all. Inquisitiveness about the world is indeed a natural attitude, but institutional science is more than that. It has rules which have to be learned and practices and techniques which have to be transmitted from generation to generation by the formal process of education, Isley notes. In short, it is an invented cultural institution, an institution not present in all societies and not one that may be counted upon to arise from human instinct. Science demands some kind of unique soil in which to flourish. Deprived of that soil, it is as capable of decay and death as any other human activity, such as religion or a system of government. Wow. So what do you think that soil is? It's... What is the, what's in the unique soil? Well, to... I, I had to choose a section of that passage um, here because it's, I, you know, you, lengthy arguments, but uh, he, here a, a little later, sh sh the um, Nancy Piercy and Charles Saxon uh, point out that Isley, even Isley, who's Dar who's a, Dar a staunch Darwinian defender, um, had to acknowledge that it was a Christian worldview that laid that foundation that that um, that was the necessary prerequisite for this kind of a scientific revolution to occur. And, and they point out that he acknowledged that uh, reluctantly. I think Leslie explained it when she just opened up the soil was the fact that Christianity teaches us that we can know things. There's a God that's knowable and that the creation is, has a sense of stability to it so that we can find answers. Yeah. So what do you think? Oh, go ahead, Leslie. I was going to say this is another example of how man has fallen out of nature and even fallen out of love with nature. Um, I like to say that there are two ways to study science directly and indirectly and the practice of using textbooks and laboratories has removed us from nature and it's robbed us of the true purpose of science, which is to study God's special revelation to us, his creation of the world and everything in it. And I think we need to practice being in nature to learn what truths and mysteries creation reveals. And we need to be reminded that nothing can replace the knowledge that comes from being in nature. Um, I think science in the West has progress because of, and I think you've all said that, rather than in spite of Christian faith, because again, we believe in an ordered universe and those God-given laws, and that's essential for its advance. Ah, so, you, so you got both what advances it and what also makes it capable of decay and death. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about that. Um, I've had a few instances over the years where I really got to be slapped in the face by the deficits of the way we study science in a modern way. One was when a Challenge 3 student asked me if he could change, once they had finished the experiment, if he could change one of the variables and try again. And I was like, why are you asking me that? Of course you can. Isn't that what we're doing in here? But it was so squashed out of him that, you know, this is what we do. We follow these instructions that he forgot that it was an experiment. Um, and the other is when I had students working on um, classification trees of their own in biology, and they they would keep coming to me going, well, this one seems to fit here and here. And I was like, yes. So now make a decision. And now you know what Linnaeus was up against when he was coming up with his classification system. Mm -hmm. So 
anyway. That's, and that's the whole point of classical conversations in our science is to give us that once a week opportunity to do some experiments together, to talk about the materials that we're reading. But that's also why we only meet one day a week for half the year so that our children have lots of times to be outside, to be in the workshop, to learn mechanics, to learn household economics, to serve other people, uh, to be employed, to just get out there and know that as um, they approach adulthood, there's gonna be a lot of continuing learning opportunities and a majority of them are around inquiry and curiosity. And so, you know, supporting their abilities to read something that maybe isn't the greatest book to read or something they're familiar with or has like lots of jargon in it. It's just one more skill that enables you to learn how to, do, um, you know, build an engine or launch a rocket, you know, because you have to read some pretty heady manuals to do that. So there's nothing wrong with the academic side. It just should not be the definition of the um, study of science. Yeah, there's a really important word that was in that first quote that we read before our break, um, positivist, which is a, a big word. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we didn't spend any time talking about it then, but uh, that's the idea that things are what they are because we say that's what they are. And so that idea, Jennifer, of your student saying, it seems to fit here and it seems to fit there. Um, just because we say something is a mammal means we've given it a good and useful categorization, but a beaver is a beaver. Whether we call it a mammal or whether we call it a fish kind of doesn't matter to what the thing is. And that's a Christian worldview is to say, God made that thing. Mm -hmm. He made it to be what it is. And we're only learning about it and trying to understand it. But we don't make it what it is. It is what it is. That's a, a realist point of view. Um, and that's one of the things that is at the root of science is that we're we're learning about things that really are and mm -hmm. trying to understand what they are, not creating things and making them what we want them to be. Yeah, that's a good reminder. Okay, well, Leslie, um, I'm going to introduce our next one and then let you read it. I appreciate you guys doing the heavy lifting today on the reading. Um, <clears throat> so it wasn't just the stability of thought in science that was important to the development of the modern Western way of thinking scientifically. Um, there's also, as we keep saying, an important connection to Christianity. So Leslie, you want to read us the next section of the book? Be happy to. Um, Presbyterian theologian Thomas Durer expresses the idea in these words. Man did not face a world full of ambiguous and capricious gods who are alive in the objects of the natural world. He had to do with one supreme creator, God, whose will was steadfast. Nature was thus abruptly desacralized, stripped of many of its arbitrary, unpredictable, and doubtless terrifying aspects. In a similar vein, Nobel Prize winning biochemist Melvin Calvin muses on the fundamental conviction in science that the universe is ordered. As I try to discern the origin of that conviction, I seem to find in it a basic notion discovered 2,000 or 3,000 years ago and enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews, namely that the universe is governed by a single God and is not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing his own province according to his own laws. This monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation for modern science. Of course, the idea of order in nature rests not simply on the existence of a single God, but also on the character of that God. The God revealed in the Bible is trustworthy and dependable. The creation of such a God must likewise be dependable. Durer explains, As the creation of a trustworthy God, nature exhibited regularity, dependability, and orderliness. It was intelligible and could be studied. It displayed a knowable order. The work of Copernicus provides a historical example. Copernicus tells us that in his search for a better cosmology than that of Aristotle and Ptolemy, he first went back to the writings of other ancient philosophers. But he uncovered significant disagreement among the ancients regarding the structure of the universe. This inconsistency disturbed him, Copernicus said, for he knew the universe was, quote, wrought for us by a supremely good and orderly creator, unquote. His own scientific work became a quest for a better cosmology. 
one that would, in the words of theologian Christopher Kaiser, uphold the regularity, uniformity, and symmetry that befitted the work of God. The thing I appreciate about that is that phrase, um, the disagreement among the ancients regarding the structure of the universe. Uh, it's one of those words that's inherent. Um, I may not be able to explain the structure, but I know there's one. Mm -hmm. Right. And so they disagree in how they explained it, but they don't disagree that there is one. Yeah. And this is maybe a little bit of a sidebar, but um, I often get asked by families who are concerned about certain aspects of classical Christian education, why we read about these ancient gods. And I think um, he summed it up well here that um, that when students read those myths, they quickly draw the same conclusion that was in this passage, um, that the universe is governed by a single God and not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing his own province according to his own laws. That chaotic nature of the um, polytheism is one of the things that students pick up on pretty quickly when they're challenged for students and they, and the comparison is, um, is definitely all in favor of a single orderly God. So what struck me in this passage is how the idea of order and nature rests, not simply on the existence of a single God, but also on the character of that God, that God revealed in the Bible, he's trustworthy and dependable. Um, and so that his creation must likewise be dependable. I think a Christian worldview presupposes those ideas um, and the intention and purpose of the creator. And in that absence that science can only describe, um, and sometimes it's just conjecture, but it cannot explain. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see, I mean, I think you understand why <clears throat> ancients would have thought the world governed by a chaotic group of fickle deities right their their world to their eyes was <clears throat> chaotic and uncertain and the more we've learned the more we know the consistency i love that the way that that quote ended the regularity uniformity and symmetry right that there are these um often breathtakingly simple principles at work in nature that, that God has put there, but that they take a long time and a lot of observations to start to really recognize what they are. Uh, and so you see that the simplicity, but also the, the amazing complexity <laughs> of God's creation. Um, and then, and then you think of the biblical principle that the more we've been entrusted with, the more responsible we are. For what we know right we we know about we know more about god's universe than they did and so now we're responsible for more as well you know and i was thinking about the positive nature that most moderns have about science um and what i'm and yet they don't respond to it like wait well, let me just be clear so a hundred years ago, a child of any age would have seen dead bodies and would have witnessed disease and would have known about the destructive nature every, uh, you know, of the creation. Um, and yet these scientists at that time had so much hope and faith in the things that are being described here. Versus today, you'd have to go pretty far in our country to find a young person who's really encountered something physically dangerous uh, when it comes to disease and death. And yet they don't trust him at all. And so it's just, it's interesting to me that how even non-Christians will get mad when bad things happen like cancer or disease or death because they know the status quo is a good God. And then they wonder what happened? The order just got disrupted in a way I was not expecting, but they don't articulate it that way. Instead, they get angry and don't always ask the best of questions. But so... So, so it's just funny that we have such expectation of goodness now compared to the medievals, yet not expectation of who it is we're saying, oh, thank God, or I'm so thankful. It's, it's just not culturally in the front that there's somebody you actually are thankful to. So it's just unusual to me how it plays out. I guess it's the same thing as like, you know, the, the lazier you are, the, the more you expect other people to do things for you. 
<laughs> yeah. I was, I was thinking that one of the, and this will be a good segue, I think to our next passage, but um, one of the things that I've loved celebrating is that idea. I'm going to tie all of you guys things together here, but the, the idea of the regularity and predictability and, and paradoxical simplicity and complexity of creation and its beauty and the opportunities we get in classical conversations to worship through our studies. So I, um, I'm having my students once again next week uh, make a presentation on something beautiful from math. And Mia came to me and said, she's my only one left at home for those of you who aren't regular listeners. And she came to me and she said, and she spent a whole morning looking through a book I happen to have called The Joy of Mathematics, trying to find an interesting idea. And finally, she came to me and said, I think I want to do fractals, but I don't know what about fractals I want to do. So I reached out to Kirstie Gilpin, our good friend, and said, hey, how about fractals? And the first thing Kirstie came back to me with was, what if what if she did fractal ferns since you were studying biology this year? And so I'm very excited for us to explore fractal ferns and have yet one more opportunity to look at the orderliness, but also the complexity and beauty and also tie everything together at the end of the semester for Mia. That is a treat to have a front seat to that. So okay. with that note, Lee, we're going to keep talking about math because we know you love math and you probably love fractal ferns. Um, so I'm going to let you read to us about um, mathematical history and its part in the evolution of scientific thought. Sure. So the intellectual fallout of the new geometries has been severe. For 2000 years, Euclidean geometry had been held up as a model of truth. But suddenly, mathematicians were no longer sure of which of several competing geometries were really true. It was as though truth itself had shattered. It became clear, says Klein, that mathematicians had adopted axioms for geometry that seemed correct on the basis of limited experience and had been deluded into thinking that these were self-evident truths. The revolution in geometry led first to a drastic decline in the status of mathematics proper. For in comparing Euclidean and non-Euclidean forms of geometry, mathematics plays a minor role. It can determine whether a system is internally consistent, but it's powerless to determine whether, determine whether it's true of the physical world. Mathematicians decided that only experience can determine which forms of geometry apply to the physical world. Mathematics proper does not deal with truth after all, but only with logical consistency. As physicist and philosopher Hans Reichenbach explains, the mathematician discovered that what he could prove was merely the system of mathematical implications of if-then relationships leading from the axioms of geometry to its theorems. He no longer felt entitled to assert axioms as true. The idea that logical truth could be separated from physical truth represented a massive shift in Western intellectual history. From the time of the ancient Greeks, most Western philosophers had assumed that reality is ultimately rational, that what is logically true is also really true. The new geometries challenged that conviction. Here were several systems that, would, that were internally consistent, yet incompatible with one another, which meant they could not all be true. A wedge was driven between what is rational and what is true. And Klein, of course, is a fairly famous mathematician from the last century. Yeah, I think you see the fallout of this in a lot of areas that aren't just math and science. It certainly is true in philosophy, right? You started, and, and then in literature and the arts, where you start to get this, um, uh, this abstraction, right? Instead of looking for truths about the world we live in, instead it became, well, what if we assumed? <laughs> what if it were like this? And you start to get all of these uh, sort of fantastic ideas that don't particularly pertain to reality at all. They're just following sort of logical rabbit trails into, uh, into a, a world that doesn't really pertain to our world. Uh, so I'm, t I'm sitting here thinking as you were reading Lee and Tim, as you were talking that 
it is it is a characteristic of man that we do that thing that sometimes we go down these mental rabbit trails and it can be very fun and it's and it's certainly um is unique to us and therefore special it's just when we can't it's when we don't acknowledge um that it doesn't correspond to reality that we get ourselves into trouble did that make sense what i just said Yeah, the corresponding to reality. And I think it would be wrong to say that these guys, that some of these math, these new geometries weren't trying to respond to reality. So for instance, uh, if you're going to look at Einstein's relativity and time can either stand still or be, um, uh, and space can uh, expand infinitely, well, all of a sudden geometry is not the same. And so if you're sitting there dealing with string theories and black holes, how is Euclidean geometry going to help? And in order for those math, for those scientific ideas to be represented as realistically as they knew how, new mathematics were started, new geometries to describe them. The thing is, they might have found good math that described them, but for me, they're back to the same place as pre-Kepler, where um, why should we believe what you say is true about the real universe when all you have is a math equation to support it. So moderns believe that there's such a thing as black holes because we have math that can describe it. But we used to have math that described a universe where the earth was the center, I mean, the galaxy. So I, I think these paragraphs or these sections are hard for people because one, they don't even know what the new maths are. And two, don't aren't grounded enough in physics to know how a scientist or mathematician looks at reality and what they're trying to do, whether they start with the first principle that God exists or or they're just trying to match the theory that they have. So let me try an example that Tim and I were talking about the other day, um, which has to do with calculus. So I think we, I think, you guys tell me if I'm on the right track here, that um, because calculus allows us to calculate rates of change, we can draw a curve that illustrates a car that's been driving for a long time at different speeds. And we can do some things by calculating the area under that curve. But ultimately there is still the reality of the car driving different speeds at every different moment. At best, the math is a model of what happened. It's not, it is not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the reality of the car. Well, that's got to be true because the majority of math mo models in order to work have to ignore things like friction and gravity. Right. <laughs> yeah. That word model is, I think, one of the most important things that you can bring up that all of our model, all, all of our science explanations and all of our math explanations are, mo are, tries, are attempts to model something, but they're never act they're never the actual thing, right? Mm -hmm. Lee, you, you said there's a, right, we have a mathematical description of a black hole but that's not a that's not a black hole it's just a model right it's no more a model than putting a, a very heavy ball of lead in the middle of a blanket and and looking at how it distorts the the surface of the blanket there's another model of a black hole but it's not really a black hole it's just a way that we try and understand something that exists in our in our universe that we don't really understand yet. Yeah. You can also see this pair, this section is why a lot of people have checked out to the academics of mathematics. Because, um, because it's too speculative. Is that what you mean when you yeah. say that? Yeah. I mean, just the fact that there's multiple mathematics and there's multiple geometries um, and what's their basis in because the new geometries don't correspond to very closely to what like Newton would say. So if an apple falls on my head, I can believe, yeah, there might be this thing called gravity. But if you're projecting that out into outer space and trying to explain it to me in the example that Tim gave too about time and space are warped, there's no such thing as, or time and space are warped and that's what gravity is. Ugh. I have no experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are, believe it or not, once again, 
out of time, but I did want to let, um, Leslie, I'm going to let you have the last word today because I know that you and I have had a lot of conversations about, um, the challenges that modern science studies pose to Christian faith. So I thought you might want to end on a, an encouraging note about this book and maybe where you see that it fills the gaps for families who have science minded kiddos. Well, yeah, I think maybe um, I'm thinking back of we began our conversation today and that is, you know, we're looking at this alliance that's current in our world between atheism and science or humanism and science. But as we said before, it's an aberration and it cannot hold. If it's false, if it's not true, it cannot hold. And so I think um, as Christians be encouraged um, uh, and don't be surprised when the ideology of modern science falls victim to science itself. And I think we've seen some examples mm -hmm. of that in our conversations today. Great. So I just want to encourage people as we as we end. Um, thanks, Leslie. But you know that uh, you really you really can know God and make Him known. And I appreciate the contribution all of you make to the classical conversations curriculum because you truly believe that. So I'll see you all next week. Bye, guys. Or Happy two weeks. <laughs> yeah, two weeks. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs>